Okay, thank you very much. First, a, a short introduction. I started using Python uh, during my university period. Then I uh, was enrolled in a company that uh, was doing Plon. And uh, since the last year, I joined syslab.com, which is uh, shipping a, a Plon internet-based solution called Quave. Uh, this is uh, what my uh, boss tells about me. It's German, so I do not even understand what it is, but I trust it. <laughs> Yeah, uh, I uh, come from, well, almost similar. Uh, I studied geophysics and then I ended up in strange places and uh, became more uh, working in various nonprofits. So I basically became a user of Plone and then an advanced user of Plone and then fell in love with the community. And the rest is history, and I still work for various nonprofits and um, use Plone to uh, help make the world a better place. Okay, thank you, President. Uh, Plone is a Python-based uh, CMS. It's an uh, open source. It, it's a very mature project. It uh, uses an ob object-oriented uh, database. And uh, as a vast community, and uh, it cares a lot about accessibility and uh, about security. Uh, also, um, it allows you to do a lot of through the web stuff and uh, has a lot of uh, features. And uh, let's say that, it, 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 like Python, it has batteries included. And uh, also, if uh, those uh, functionalities are not enough, we have uh, thousands of add ons to, and teams to, suite, to, to fit uh, all the use cases. Uh, a short timeline about Plone. Plone is uh, almost an adult now, <laughs> and uh, <laughs> by real. <laughs> and uh, the first Plone conference was in 2003, New Orleans. And uh, the Plone Foundation, which we have the president here, is uh, started in 2004. You see, we have uh, uh, deployed many versions of Plone. Now we are close, uh, close to ship the 5.1 version. Okay. And I can demo some of um, a use case of Plone. So, uh, this is a fresh plone site. It, uh, you can do, uh, it suggests you uh, things to set up at the beginning. For example, you can set up a, 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 an SMTP. And uh, I set up a mock SMTP just to, to see what's happening. I send a, a test email. I go to my uh, web UI for this SMTP. I, I can see that uh, the mail is sent. That will be useful later, because now you see uh, when you are logged in, you can you have a lot of features. But of course, uh, now we are admin, and we want to test it with uh, a regular user to see what a user can do. So uh, we go to the control panel where we have lots of functionality to uh, like adding users, and we have regular. Uh, uh, fields for uh, your user, but we want to add one. And through the web, it's possible to add a new field, gender, for example, and uh, we can configure it to be a, a choice between uh, some values. Okay, easy peasy. We go now back to the, okay, you see the, the field here. We can uh, also set it up, for example, providing values, male, female, whatever, you never know. We do not require it because we, it may be sensitive data. Uh, okay, we now add this uh, user. And of course, all the fields are set. And uh, I can set up the gender if I want to whatever. And now I have this user, Alan Nis, uh, just an, an example user. And I can see if, uh, uh, you can see I received an email that uh, with the confirmation link, uh, I can then log in as this, uh, this user. Okay, now I'm logged in as this, uh, as this user. You see that uh, respect to the administrator, I can do well less stuff, but uh, I would like to add a, a news item. So the admin can uh, go to the news item as well, go to the sharing tab and, and uh, look for Alan and uh, share the possibility uh, to him to add new stuff here. And now he has uh, more items in his toolbar and uh, it can add uh, a news here. So I will just skip some seconds. Okay, he can add a lead image. Okay, so he's going to add the news about the Plone conference. 
and uh, you see that the news is here. Now, an um, uh, anonymous user cannot see anything, okay, because the news is created private as default. So Alan wants to publish it, publish it but he has no, not the right to publish it. So it's just pending review, and uh, he needs a more powerful user to, to do that. Uh, that user can be admin, but uh, there are other users that uh, uh, which uh, we can grant the permission to do that. Now the news is published, and the, the anonymous user can see it. So that's just an example use case that shows you how to uh, how the security of Plone works. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Sorry. <laughs> okay. So, you want to yeah. talk about presentation? Yeah, um, I think uh, it's important to note that um, what you just saw, this whole setup of different, that you can add a field to a, a user specification, gender or credit card number or whatever you want to know of them. You can do it through the web, but you can also do it programmatically. Um, and that is true of almost anything in Plone, setting up users, setting up groups. Um, you can rapidly prototype it through the web, and, or uh, you can have your um, advanced user uh, do that, but then you can save the specification uh, and put that in uh, version control and have that part of your deployment. So the next time you want to deploy a site just like that, you don't have to go clickety-clickety-click again. Um, you have that as a normal file system uh, Python egg. Um, yeah, security, we take security very serious. We have a very nice security team. Um, most of the vulnerabilities, all systems have vulnerabilities, Plone included. We just have less of them. And most of them tend to be discovered by our own uh, security team. And one of the most uh, often misused class of vulnerabilities is SQL injection, which doesn't work because we don't use SQL. So that helps. Um, but also, the, what we've had most were issues with cross-site scripting, but that has been taken care of in Plone 5, even for the add-ons that you write. Okay. For example, we had uh, uh, the FBI is uh, using a Plone solution for, um, for its website, and we have this fake news uh, that at the end, uh, was a good advertisement for us because they uh, they claimed they they had a zero day for FBI.gov, which was not true. Uh, was probably not true. And uh, at, at the end, we were happy uh, that the Plona name was uh, associated with uh, uh, such a big site that was concerned about security. And uh, <laughs> also in December, we saw that uh, uh, security issues were quite a thing during the presidential elections. Okay. So also, we can do a lot of stuff uh, with the content that we manage through, the, through our site. For example, we have uh, uh, bulk editing and bulk upload features. Uh, we can tag many items uh, uh, at a time or, or remove them, rename, sort, uh, or reorganize our stuff uh, through a slick uh, interface. And uh, we have, a, a, as you saw before, a control panel where we can set up the experience uh, that uh, the user have uh, on their website. For example, we can set up, uh, as you saw, the mail settings, but also the team. We can install add-ons. Uh, uh, we can set up user and group and customize also contents. This is one nice feature that uh, uh, I will show you. Uh, we have several contents. Uh, we can add new one or modify existing one. For example, uh, mm, we have the, uh, the page, um, and which is a, a, normal, uh, a normal HTML page. We can add new field here, or, um, or um, uh, also uh, new behaviors. Behaviors are groups of fields, which uh, contains, uh, uh, for example, um, ways to configure your uh, your content type. For example, you can set up uh, uh, if you want to the pages to be discussed, and this will uh, fire up some uh, uh, commenting system on the website. And we have several options for that. Also, for example, you want to enable the lead image field on a page. 
uh, to make it more beautiful. And uh, if we do that, we will see, for example, the field appearing when uh, we are going to add or edit a, a new page. Uh, also, Plone is uh, friendly with uh, so social media and SEO. It allows you to configure already uh, through the web uh, um, your Twitter account, your Facebook account, so that uh, when uh, your uh, website, uh, website is rendered, it has already all the meta tags that uh, allow it to be well indexed uh, for the search engines and uh, to be well shared on the social, uh, on the social networks. Uh, you want to continue? Yeah. <clears throat> Uh, from the beginning and right up to now, Plone has always been very good with multilingual, probably because it was uh, partly uh, thought of, of in Norway, which as a tiny country has, there are two uh, languages already, and it's being used a lot also by uh, governments and local governments in places like Switzerland, where being trilingual is uh, mandatory. So uh, being multilingual is not something, some edge case, it's something that we do and that needs to be done and that works quite well. Um, so you can set up uh, several languages and um, it will sort of, uh, it will not automatically translate for you. You can uh, put an add-on in that will put in uh, a Google Translate for you as a starter, but please don't do this on your live website. <laughs> the translations of Google or Bing or whatever are getting better, but hire a human to do the final editing. But you can then have all your content in multiple languages and it will either fall back by the cookie that the user has or the user's preferred language, or you could do it by IP or you could set it, um, well, any way you want actually. So also you can do fancy stuff, uh, some other fancy stuff through the web, of course also uh, coding your, your own Python packages, but uh, if you need to quickly change uh, the colors of your website, uh, you are allowed to do that. You can also edit uh, through the web uh, your, your team uh, files. For example, we support out of the box less and uh, we can compile less uh, um, uh, clicking the button build CSS that you see above. And uh, so uh, it allows uh, you to uh, customize your team to, through the web. Of course, you can provide packages or uh, either as Python packages, either as uh, zip files that you can upload. Once you uh, have this uh, uh, team available on your website, you can activate them and uh, uh, have what, whatever team you like. And also you can switch back and forth uh, between these, uh, these teams. Okay, some technical facts for the audience. Uh, okay, we care very much about upgrades. We will see a slide dedicated to that later. And like certain compatibles, <laughs> competitors starting with a D and then in the <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. And uh, we have a, um, a very simple JavaScript solution that allows you uh, to, to activate fancy features uh, uh, very fast. And um, then I will show you how to, to start working with Plone. So about upgrades, we have a, a machinery in place that uh, uh, allows you to, through upgrade steps, to update your database to the latest version of your code. Of course, you have a dry run mode, so you can, uh, you can test it before, uh, uh, before you screw up everything. Of course, the, it's always, always suggested to do that on a staging server before doing that in production, but uh, also add-ons can profit of this machinery to provide sane upgrades. About the, uh, our JavaScript solution, we provide uh, um, JavaScript modules called patterns that can be easily uh, applied to your team, just setting uh, classes and attributes. Okay, so yeah. you have a regular HTML, you apply a class that is called path sortable and automatically the uh, list items will be uh, and draggable and droppable, and uh, then you can uh, you can set up the UI to uh, understand this. 
and uh, it's fine because you have just to set a class and uh, configure the, the pattern through uh, some, mm, uh, to, to some data attributes that uh, are well documented. Uh, and uh, I suggest you to check this uh, pattern solution, which is called mockup. And uh, I provide you the link that will be staying in the slide that I will share. About the documentation. Yeah, uh, I should talk a little bit about that because um, I am also on the documentation team. And yeah, uh, if you don't have documentation for a product, your product does not exist, is uh, our firm belief in the documentation team. Um, the Plone documentation, if you've last seen it five years ago, we're very sorry. It was in a bit of a mess. It had grown very organically. Um, but there's been a huge effort to reorganize it. It's now all reachable under docs.plow.org. Um, the setup is uh, slightly more sane. Um, you hopefully will be able to find what you do, uh, what you want to know. Um, Plone is made up of a huge number of components, quite a large number, but all the components that you need for either theming, uh, for uh, beginner users, for advanced users, for developers, are all under there in different sections. Um, we have begun the work on translating the docs using Transifex. Um, they are not finished yet. There are developer docs in Chinese and partly in Brazilian Portuguese right now. Um, but not very many other languages have complete developer docs. Most developers tend to speak English anyway, but there is a huge community in China which prefers the Chinese uh, developer docs. So it is important. Uh, we've now also started uh, using uh, Selenium uh, robot framework to generate the screenshots uh, for our documentation. That is nice because they will also be uh, updated if a new version comes out. And they also serve as, as tests. If somebody breaks something in, the, uh, in our screenshotting, it means the user interface has changed, uh, which means that the documentation must follow suit because there's a new button or something. So we're, try we're treating our documentation as part of our continuous integration setup, which helps to keep it in line. Uh, and all the building and the testing is done via continuous integration. We're still improving on that one. Um, it is, uh, it's a relatively new trend in documentation land to treat your documentation as code. That should be tested, but we're getting there. So we're using all kinds of dockerized containers and uh, hooks to automatically spell check, link check, uh, use the right terminology, and also check for file age. So we get a little ping if uh, a file hasn't been touched for a year. Um, that doesn't mean it's wrong. It could just be the perfect documentation, but it's, it gives you a guide like, you may want to check if this is still up to date. Uh, and it could be in some hidden corner of your documentation that you don't tend to read because you already know it. So it's good to have file checks on your documentation. I can recommend that for any software project. Okay. Speaking about tests, all these features are, uh, of course, integrated together and uh, things can, uh, can break without you uh, acknowledging it. But, of course, we have a, a wonderful Jenkins uh, setup put in place. And uh, this allows us uh, to test pull requests, also um, um, addressing several versions at a time. And uh, this uh, makes uh, Plone really, really solid. You can be quite confident that uh, uh, you are not breaking stuff, customizing things, and uh, or uh, improving things. And this is quite uh, something that you need when you have to handle with 300 packages. So if uh, you want to, uh, to train yourself and start using Plone, we have a dedicated training website when uh, you can follow up the training. So all the training material is there. And uh, it is uh, addressed to several kind of uh, uh, interests uh, of users. For example, if you want to do content management, we have a dedicated training. If you are a sysadmin, uh, there is the, uh, the deployment training. Uh, if you want to develop or customize the Plone, there is a, uh, another course and, and, uh, and so on. Uh, training usually happen during events. For example, during the Plone conference, uh, uh, there are uh, all these kind of training and uh, they are included in the conference price. 
so I suggest you to, to look for them. About the Plon community, uh, it's, uh, the, the Plon community is very, is very solid, and uh, on GitHub, uh, we have an organization with 400 people uh, dealing about uh, with 300 public uh, repositories. And uh, we also have another organization called Collective, which contains packages that are not in the core, at least for the moment, but uh, contains uh, add-on. For example, uh, Solar integration, Elasticsearch integration, whatever you want integration. And there are even more people. Of course, some of them are also in the Plon organization. And it contains uh, 1,500 um, 1, public repositories. And uh, <laughs> you, you saw that uh, res recently uh, GitHub uh, uh, hyped that uh, uh, there were 100 million pull requests merged and uh, almost uh, one, uh, per, uh, one per, um, 0 0.1 per mil uh, of them was in the Plon community, which is uh, quite good. And um, yeah, as a whole, you will also meet us at EuroPython and um, we're generally a friendly bunch. Um, we have some weird oddities that, I don't know, some our pants tend to swap, um, but that's not required. Um, but, but yeah, just approach uh, the people in the Plone community. Plone, uh, we should still stress, is not run by a single com uh, company. Uh, unlike some other open source projects, there is no overriding company. There's just a foundation to hold the intellectual property and the rest are all small uh, uh, contractors, uh, integrators, uh, consultancy firms, and university staff who together as a community create and uh, decide where Plum goes. So where Plum goes is de decided by the community, it's looked over by a framework team, uh, everything is organized by teams, but there is no big dictator-like firm that says like, this is where we're going, that's not how we roll. So, on, uh, also on uh, the Python package index, there are a lot of Plon, uh, um, Plon projects that uh, can be used uh, right away. So I suggest you to check it because there you can find teams, customization, uh, uh, and some other uh, packages. Also, Plone is an important user base. Uh, there are, as I was saying before, there are many uh, United States Plone sites, for example, the FBI, the CIA, and the uh, uh, NASA, and uh, universities, whatever. Also, it was um, also a big success the past year because the Brazil uh, government, it, which is using heavily Plone, and uh, used the um, Plone for his uh, Olympic website. And uh, this is, was quite a, quite a thing because uh, uh, that website has to survive a, a spike of uh, users that wanted to uh, know uh, what was happening there. Uh, spikes of editors that were uploading, for example, many pictures uh, at the time uh, for, for the events. And uh, so also <laughs> had to be extremely uh, secure because, uh, of course, the facing the uh, uh, Olympics website uh, was a, a, sweet, uh, a sweet target for many, many crackers. Also, uh, this year, we, sub we have uh, five Google Summer of Code students, which uh, are doing actually well. And uh, there are some projects that uh, uh, you can build on top of Plon, basically whatever you want. And there are a couple of projects that uh, raised quite interest uh, recently. There is Castle CMS, which provides um, some uh, UI enhancement for, uh, um, for, the, for Plon. And uh, we expect to backport some of the Castle CMS features soon to, to Plon. Uh, also, there is Quave, which is a, a kind of Plone distribution targeted for uh, internet, and uh, it allows you to interact mm, w uh, socially uh, with uh, your uh, your customer. Uh, yeah. So, so Ca Castle is done by an American firm, and they really focus on security because if you have like a three-letter agency. Um, they're probably their clients, and if I tell you exactly their clients, black helicopters will descend and we will end up somewhere where we don't want to be. Um, so, but they've also uh, really focused on uh, usability using very modern 
uh, JS techniques, if you have, for instance, an image, you can set a focal point so that whatever, if, if it appears on uh, an, a phone or a tablet or a 27 inch monitor, uh, in different uh, uh, aspect ratios, always the focal point will be part of the, the center of the picture. And yes, as said, we fully expect that to, this has been pioneered in Castle CMS. We will backport that into regular clone. Okay, yeah. And uh, about Quave, it's, uh, it has a, a lot of social features. It has a, a, an activity stream where you can upload stuff and uh, comment on it. Uh, also, you can share stuff, uh, you have uh, contacts and uh, whatever. And its uh, main target is to be uh, simple, simple for users because uh, uh, some internets are just a, a bucket where you put stuff and forget. Instead, here you, are, uh, you want your uh, content to be live and used by you, you, your users. And uh, it is also extensible uh, uh, through um, one thing called apps that uh, can basically customize your uh, user experience. Okay, this is the how it is blown now, uh, but there are things happening in the in the background to uh, to improve the blown experience uh, more. And for example, the uh, we are close to release the 5.1 uh, version, and uh, this one, for example, um, supports uh, 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 Retina mode displays. Uh, you can uh, by default it is disabled. But uh, you can enable it and support uh, two pair or three pair uh, um, uh, density, uh, high density displays. Uh, you can also, uh, for example, um, set up uh, the, the size of the previews that, uh, of your images that uh, are uh, uploaded uh, at maybe even at the regular size, but then served, scaled automatically uh, when needed. So, for example, uh, enabling this uh, feature, it allows you to, uh, to automatically uh, um, render the image tag for the images uh, uh, with the source set, uh, with the appropriate source set uh, um, attribute. And so, the browser will uh, understand uh, which is the best picture that it should, it should download. This, of course, uh, uh, is a, a big UI win. And um, yeah, yeah. Well, one other that has just been finished last week. The, we had a sprint last week in Finland. Is the redirection tool? There was always a redirection tool in Plown. So uh, where you put on an alias for a URL and that goes actually to another content item, but it was hidden. Uh, it, there was no easy web interface for it. Uh, now there is, and it will be released in uh, 5.1. You might say, why is this important? Why don't you do a rewrite in Nginx or Apache or whatever your front end is? Well, I am a site administrator much more than a developer, but, uh, and, but also I am now in Italy. And of course, my colleagues um, launched a new web campaign and they decided at the very last moment to change the URL that they were putting out for their web campaign. Um, otherwise, they would have to bother me while I was dancing in the coconut club. Uh, that is not nice. Now, a normal editor can say like, oops, no, we decided this other URL is much catchier and it will do better on social media. So let's uh, put in an alias. So it puts power in the hands uh, where it belongs, namely your site editors and your content editors, and not in the power of sysadmins or people who have access to the Nginx rewrite rules. So it's all a way of uh, enabling power users to do what they do best, namely thinking up uh, catchy names and not being dependent on the tech people to then implement it. So it's, it may seem small, but um, my users are very happy with it and it's a good win for a lot of things. Okay, so this is a, another screen that shows you how to set aliases for your, uh, for your pages. And we have this uh, uh, wonderful model that we, um, we basically uh, start with add-ons and then incorporate it with, uh, um, in, the, um, in the core. 
And uh, this is a, an add-on called Mosaic that allows you to create uh, very complex composite pages through the web. And this is, I would say it's amazing, because you see it allows you to add an image with the appropriate preview and uh, add some, cost, uh, some content there and customize it. And you can add also, yeah. Um, and for the more uh, conservative types amongst us, you can also pre-make some layouts and say like only this class of people are allowed to use this kind of um, uh, site layout because this gives a, a site editor unlimited, almost unlimited ways of styling a single web page or a landing page. But some institutions go completely freaky on that and say like, oh, our corporate style says it's, our logo should always be in the left upper corner. Um, you can also say, okay, you are not allowed to change that. You are, the, the logo will always appear there, and you, poor little intern, are not allowed to make really wild uh, changes. You can just change the text. So we think of both the very creative uh, uh, end user, but also the ones that are restricted by corporate or uh, institutional uh, standards. Okay, and as you saw, uh, the created page is not just uh, composed by many stuff, but you can also, um, you, you can edit whatever, uh, add whatever you want, but also fetch content from uh, other parts of uh, your website. So for example, if you have a, 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 a already a news item somewhere, you can say, okay, uh, get the text uh, from uh, this, uh, this object and display it here. And of course, it is uh, the page. The created page is uh, responsive. Okay. So, wait. Fine. So also, we have another thing that uh, our uh, editors uh, uh, love. Uh, you saw before that uh, we could add uh, um, fields to our users, fields to our regular contents. But uh, there, there are also add-ons. For the moment, they are not yet in the core, but they are um, very loved by our customers. And um, they allow you to create through the web forms. So for example, you can create a basic form with some fields, and uh, you can add uh, new fields exactly as uh, I um, shown before for uh, the user. And uh, after you add your field, you can customize them as you want. And of course, also these forms, can be uh, published or can be uh, set as private or shared with just some people. So also here you have a, a huge amount of security considered by design. Okay. Yeah, <clears throat> um, to make uh, Plone more useful to a wider group of people, we're also now uh, bringing out the REST API. Um, that means you have basically all the power of clone, all the security, all the 15 years of experience that we have. And if you don't like our front end, um, write your own. Um, it's a complete and it's fully REST. It's not fake REST as many other uh, uh, so-called RESTy APIs are. Um, so you can do everything through REST calls and you can write uh, alternative front ends. And that's already being used in production by s several French ministries, for instance, to provide important information uh, to their citizens on uh, natural disasters and strikes, uh, or uh, lightning strikes and floods and things like that. So you can build a single page application with React or Angular or whatever is new tomorrow um, in the JavaScript world, but we provide React and Angular now as standard if you use something super fancy, um, I'm sure you know how to do it. Um, and this will become also the internal way we actually talk to our own uh, backend. So the, also our own widgets will start using React. So you can build, what we are providing is basically what is nowadays called a headless CMS. It's a bit of a nasty word, especially on Bastille Day today where they, you know where that ended, the headless thingy, um, let them eat cake, I say. But yeah, that's where we're going. So in the roadmap, uh, currently we're at the 5.1 series. Um, we have blocks and tiles, which is what you just saw with Mosaic. Uh, we're moving to ZOP4, which is Python 3 compatible, finally. Sorry, we took a while. Um, there's lots of 
content in a content management system and there's amazing amounts of strings that have to be Unicode um, and stuff. So we're getting the UI improvements in. Um, we're using the REST API ourselves, it'll be in core, and as for JavaScript deployments, we have tried everything in the last um, few years, and we're now standardizing on Webpack, that seems to be finally the JavaScript world is also moving to solidifying. Webpack works, it works today, even a JavaScript klutz like me can use it, you can tree shake and do fancy stuff, um, so that's beginning to solidify finally. Uh, at the same time, we are using this uh, headless uh, track, so if you don't like our user interface, write your own. Um, and basically what we then say, we provide content as a service. You can write uh, native uh, mobile applications. Um, the backend is exactly the same source code that we're using for 5.x. So you, uh, you're staying completely compatible. You can say like one group of users gets the full web interface. The other will just be a simple uh, phone application to write your internal memos for your super large institution. At the same time, we're also thinking already and working already on Plone 6, um, which will be fully uh, compatible with Python 2.7 and 3.5. Plone itself will run uh, on 3.5, but we have a huge uh, add-on ecosystem as well, so we have to give people time to, uh, to rewrite their add-ons as well. So for at least one major ver version, we will have to be compatible with both uh, 2.7 and 3.x, um, because, yeah, large institutions need time to uh, rewrite their add-ons. We're going to be using a new uh, user interface, which I gave a lightning talk about, called Pastanaga. For some reason, we like the Catalans, so we usually have Catalan-themed themes. Is that very meta? Well, um, uh, the tiles you saw before will be default, and if you've used Plone in the past, we uh, used to have archetypes as, content, as our content type framework. We now have dexterity since a long time. Uh, archetypes will be gone. Um, but fair warning, they've been deprecated since two years already. And there is already in, uh, in first production a, um, ex it was an experimental fork, but it turned out quite successful, so people are using it already, where uh, people are using a completely different backend uh, as a storage layer. Uh, it's completely based on async IO, uh, AO HTTP, so that means it's ma massively horizontal scalable. Just hire more cloudy thingies if you get more users. Um, it uses exactly the same REST API that the rest of the Plone family is using. So your code is compatible. So you can start out saying, I'm just using standard Plone because that's what I know. Um, and then suddenly you get uh, bought by uh, venture capital or whatever. And you need uh, a million users and you're like, oh, now I need to scale. Um, the backdrop uh, uh, against this guillotine now, which is a headless CMS, is that there is no default front end. The people who have developed it have written their own, but it's um, custom for their uh, firm. Okay. Time to thank you. Thank you, audience. And uh, I have to thank you also the, the people that contributed to this presentation, that were many. And uh, I uh, invite you to the Plon conference that will be at in Barcelona, because we like Catalans, in uh, October. <laughs> and uh, so uh, the last slide has some themes uh, that uh, we touched during the presentation. If uh, you have questions, you're welcome. Sander Pisa and Paul Ruland, and we are going to go to questions. Hi, thank you for your talk. Um, I have a question regarding the documentation. You mentioned that you automated all the spell check ages of the file and so on. Can you give us like um, more detail about how you did it? Which technology you used behind? Oh, sorry. Um, I was talking about the, the documentation. You mentioned that you automated the documentation. Yeah. So you checked if the file are well composed, 
if there's no spell check and so on and so forth. Can you detail more the technologies you use behind? Uh, yes, we're using, uh, well, there's, there's various um, tests you can run. Uh, we're actually using some based on Koala, which um, are being used here. So there's various NPM uh, modules that do, uh, there's one called Write Good, which checks uh, if you have very long and complex sentences, and then will give you alternatives. There's also one that checks if you use offensive language. So it will give you a flag if you say, um, hey, why are you saying master-slave combination, where it could be primary and secondary. Um, there's lots of tools available nowadays that do natural language processing. It's basically linting, but for language. So, um, it just uh, helps create, because especially, well, I'm Dutch, uh, um, there's a lot of Germans as well. Uh, we, both the Dutch and the Germans, tend to make really long sentences with lots of commas, um, which is bad for understandable and uh, understandability, so it's better to break them up. So it will actually flag it and say, like, rewrite this in short, easy to use sentences, because not everybody is a native English speaker, and not everybody is a German or Dutch speaker who likes commas and bits of sentences added on at the end. Um, so we're using, we're, we're using them in Docker containers just because it's easier, but you could use them directly as well. But since uh, quite a few of our um, documentation writers use Windows, uh, we got kind of bored of explaining how to install certain tools on Windows, and some of them don't work. So now we use Docker containers and just say, do that on your Windows machine, and it kind of works. And it's and it's all open source, so you could probably find it in your GitHub Docker. Yes, yeah, it's all open source. You can find it, and we uh, the parts that are not Plo specific uh, are um, well, they should be out there now or next week. We have a new uh, site called testthedocs.org. Testthedocs.org. Uh, we will also be at uh, Write the Docs conference in Prague uh, in September. So all the parts that are non-PLO specific, we are very happy to share with the wider documentation writing community. So you, you mentioned that one of the things that you also check when you're uh, linting the documentation is the file age. So if uh, one document is older than uh, one year, it pings you and uh, this document hasn't been updated yet. Uh, can you snooze this notification? Like, okay, I get it. Remind me in half a year, don't bother me now. Yes, yes. Well, the easiest thing is to just to touch the documentation then, the, or that file. That's a bit cheating, but that's how we do it now. And it's, yeah, you just say, okay, it's um, just update the file stamp and you're fine. So that's the cheap and easy way to say, like, shut up for a year. And I'm sure you could do other ways, but yeah, you can also over-engineer things. So once a human has looked at it and said, hey, it's actually fine, just change the file date. Any other questions here? Anyone? Well, I have a question, if you don't mind. I've, I've never used Blown, but uh, uh, unfortunately, our marketing team still uses uh, WordPress. How easy it is for them to move from WordPress? Um, it's, it's easy to move from WordPress. Um, there is a, a tool called Transmogrifier, um, which sounds quite, it is quite technical. You would need a technical person to set it up. It's basically a pipeline where you take uh, content out of an SQL database. So you, you can either scrape the WordPress site, but that's a bit painful. So you, if you have access to the database behind it, it's much easier. So you get all the bits of content out. And with Transmogrifier, you can turn that into pieces of content that you can directly shoot into Plone. And you can do all kinds of things in the meanwhile. Because it's a pipeline, um, it's a Python-based tool, it's, um, but it is file system-based. It is not fit for content editors, but it's very fit for people who set up sites. And you can say, well, this WordPress site was kind of old, so let's do a new um, site structure anyway, because it was time. Let's sanitize all our titles while we're at it, uh, and do all kinds of easy Pythonic things to the titles to make them more readable and bring them in a better shape. 
So you, there's recipes for WordPress, for Drupal, for um, I wrote one for Joomla because for some reason I had, was l left with 20 Joomla sites that I should take care of. So <laughs> uh, then you sort of run this transmogrifier. It runs for like 15 minutes and kadoom, you have a new plone site with all your old content. Thank you so much. Great. Okay. Thanks. Thank you. We're out of time.